I win, I get the last peg. Ow. Well, doesn't everyone just feel better now? Everyone got hugs, everyone got smiled, everyone got encouraged. And as we talked about, we're here because of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. <coughs> Today we're going to talk about opening our eyes. Because opening our eyes is a fantastic and a necessity in order to be effective in serving. You know, when I thought about a lesson and the text that we're going to be going over today, I thought about a story that I heard about a little Native American boy. <coughs> now, this na little Native American boy was about to become a brave. But in his tribe, in order to become a brave, you were called to be led out into a wilderness section with your father. And you were to be there and left alone for a few days. And after a few days of reflection and meditation, you were to find your way home all by yourself. And so this father looked at his son and said, Son, it's time for you to become a brave. And, at the, and so they started walking along the path. And his father was taking him to the spot where they would bring these young boys to sit and meditate and, and then have to come back on their journey. But when the father brought his son there, and as he was about to go, his son started crying, saying, Dad, please don't leave me. Don't go. I'm scared. I don't know how to get back. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm not ready. But the father held his son and said, Son, you're ready. You're going to be all right. You're going to be a brave. And that encouraged the son. And then his father started walking away. At, until he could no longer see him. And so he sat there for a day, and then he sat there for another day, and he sat there for a third day, and on that third day he knew, it's time to go home now. And so as he started making his way, he didn't know which direction to go, so when he was going, he would walk one way, but then he would hear these sounds like animals, and so he would walk and stop, and he would go the other way, and he would go and walk and that was kind of leading him. He was just thinking, I just need to avoid these animals. If I just listen to those sounds, I'll walk in the different direction. And then it came nighttime. And as he did, in order to protect himself, he created a fire. And he was sitting by the fire. And when he was sitting there, he heard the sound of wolves. And he got scared. And he was saying, Dad, Dad, I wish you were here. I'm scared. And he heard the sound of the wolves. And then after hearing them for a while, it was dead silent, and he didn't hear the wolves any longer. A few, an hour passed, and he's sitting at his fire still, and then he heard the sound of mountain lions, and he was scared, and he was saying, Dad, Dad, I wish you were here. And, and he heard the sounds of these mountain lions, but then after a little while, it was silent again. And then the third time, he heard the sound of a bear, and he was saying, Dad, Dad, I wish you were here. I'm scared. And he heard the sounds of the bears, but then after a while, it went silent. And then after a little while, he was able to fall asleep. And then he woke up in the morning, and he started walking, listening and following his plan to avoid the sounds of animals and he walked and then he got to a point where he finally figured out where he was and he was able to return home. And when he finally arrived at the home, the whole tribe was there celebrating that he had come back a man as a brave. And as he was celebrating, everyone was celebrating, he was looking around and said, where's my father? His father then walked into the camp all dirty and bloody. And then his son walked up to him and said, Dad, I did it. I'm a brave. But where were you? I came into the camp. I didn't know where you were. It was at that point he finally realized all the noises that he heard to direct his path were made by his father. And there was a wolf 
on that fireside, but his father drew that wolf away from his son. There was a mountain lion, and then the same thing, his father drew that lion away. And there really was a bear, and he drew that bear away. And then he looked at his son and said, Son, I knew you felt scared and afraid and confused, and you didn't know where you were going, and you probably thought you were alone. But let me tell you this, not once were you ever alone. You know, I think about that, and I kind of think about, that's how we are in our lives. And even in our service to God, sometimes when we look at our lives and our problems, and we look even at doing God's will, and confused and fearful and afraid of all the different things about what it means to follow Jesus and doing His will, sometimes we ask the question and say, God, where are you? Where are you in all this? I can't handle life on my own. I can't handle problems on my own. I can't do the will of God on my own. Where are you? But then I think, as I read through the scriptures, we realize God is there. God is there in the times of difficulty. God is there in the times of suffering, even when we grow. God is there guiding us and directing our steps if we're willing to listen. And all the time we realize we're never really alone. God is there for us. And it's because of God's guidance and because of God's power and God's protection and providence that we are able to do His will. So one of the things that we often need to do is just learning to open our eyes to the presence of God. Because when we start realizing that, we start seeing God in our lives, and we see God working, and we see God present, that changes our perspective in how we go about living life. And in fact, this is something that a, a man and a prophet by the name of Elisha teaches his servant in the Old Testament. He teaches them to know that God is present. God is real and God is powerful. And if we learn to do that, we will learn how to live our lives right in view of God. We can learn how to serve God, knowing that it's not based on our ability to speak. It's not based on our ability to be knowledgeable. It's not based on our talents. It's based all and solely on the power and the character and the nature of God himself. And that's an important thing that we always need to return back to. But let's look. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to read this whole section, and then we're going to get some different points from it. <clears throat> Starting in verse 8, it says, Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel, and after conferring with his officers, he said, I will sit on my camp in such and such a place. And the man of God sent a word to the king of Israel, Beware of passing that place, because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God, and time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram, and he summoned his officers and demanded of them, Tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go, find out where he is. The king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there, and they went by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, Open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. 
As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elijah had asked. And Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they had entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, Shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those who you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. So I want us to look at some lessons we should learn about how to live life and how we should go about doing God's will. You know, one of the things that we learn from this passage and this narrative, this story, is that we should not fear obstacles or opposition. You know, you see a contrast between Elisha and his servant. Now we see that the, city, the king of Aram was this powerful, mighty man, this man of violence, this man of valor. He had a powerful army. He was going against God's people, Israel. And so he had this plan, we're going to defeat. But every time he created a plan, the king of Israel moved his troops on the words of Elisha. But then in hearing all this, the king of Aram sent his whole army to surround Elisha. They were pursuing all, just this one man. Imagine ISIS trying to find you. And they have all their people surrounding you. How would you feel in that moment? You'd feel afraid. You'd be uh, scared. And, but here's the thing. Elisha wasn't scared. His servant was. And he said, what should we do? And Elisha was telling him, you know what, those who are with us are stronger than them. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be in, uh, fearful of that because of those who are with us. And so he prayed to God, asking for the servant's eyes to be open. You know, one of the reasons why we struggle, and Rob made this point in class this morning, Sometimes we're just so afraid. We're afraid of people. We're afraid of what people think. We're afraid of a variety of different things. But then when we realize who is on our side, that seems to take away that fear. One of the things that Elisha did was pray to God to open his eyes to really see what God saw. To see what Elisha saw. And that's the prayer that I sometimes pray for me and for our congregation is, God, God, open our eyes so that we won't be afraid because if we can open our eyes and we can see God and we can see what God is doing and what, how God is present, that will change our perspective on everything. That we won't have to be afraid like the servant. And this king and the people of Aram knew, surrounded Elisha. They knew Elisha was a prophet. They knew from their history that Elisha was a prophet because in the fifth chapter, the commander of the king of Aram went to Elisha to be healed from his leprosy. They knew this guy really is a prophet. This man is powerful. And they surrounded the camp. They surrounded the city of Dothan and for, to get Elisha. But Eli Elisha was not afraid. You know, one of the reasons why we're so afraid is we're afraid to be hated. If I asked you simply, simply, why are you afraid to share Jesus Christ? Why are you afraid to live godly in front of your coworkers? Why are you afraid? So much of it is because we don't want to be hated. But the Apostle John tells us in 1 John 3.13, he says, Do not be a surprise, my brothers, if the world hates you. Sometimes we're kind of surprised that as Christians, as moral people, we're like, why would the world hate us? It's because they hate Jesus. I mean, we, it's not that we're not going to have opposition. We are going to have opposition. It's important to realize we're going to have opposition. The point that we see throughout Scripture is do not be afraid. 
because of who is with you. God was with Moses when Moses was in Egypt. God was with Joshua when he was at Jericho. God was with Daniel when he was in Babylon. The amazing thing that we need to realize is that we're going to have opposition, but the one who is with us is stronger. You know, one of the things that we have to, a truth that we need to accept about Christianity in order to press forward in doing His will in the face of opposition is realizing that Christianity will lead you to the experience the greatest extent of love. You know, when you're among, when you realize how much God loves you, you're going to experience the, the love that God intended for you to experience. When you're among God's people, just a moment ago, we were hugging and smiling, encouraging each other, just as the scripture tells us to do. We're experiencing the greatest extent of love that God purposed us for. But here's the thing. We sometimes want that part of Christianity, but then we forget there's another side of Christianity. It's going to lead us to the greatest extent of love, but we also know Christianity will lead you to experience the greatest extent of hate as well. Sometimes the world is going to hate you. Sometimes you're going to be rejected. Sometimes you're going to have forces, and sometimes you're going to be asking, how can I go through life? How can I do God's will? There's so many obstacles, so many op people opposing me. How can I possibly do it? Then you realize, regardless of who it is, as long as you have God on your side, you're still the more powerful. You know, one of the things that we often think about is we think of all the reasons why we're fearful in opposition and doing God's will. We think of rejection. We think of lack of resources, being burned, exhaustion, lack of time, self-esteem. What are people going to think about me if they hurt my feelings? You know, we create all the opposition. We think of all the reasons why we can't serve God in the way that Scripture calls disciples of Jesus to actually do those things and be like Him. We, but how do we change it? You know, for the solution to, for the servant was for Elisha to pray to God to open up his eyes. To kind of see what God has seen. Because oftentimes this is how we kind of view God. Sometimes we see life and all we see are the obstacles. And behind the obstacles, we see God. But because in our minds we have created these obstacles to be so big and so large that we can't see God. We can't see God because all we're seeing are all the problems, all the excuses, all the obstacles, all the enemies, all the opposition. But what if we change our perspective to flip it around where now we see God. And then when, when God is the bigger part, the obstacles are hidden behind Him. And it's like, now our focus is on Him. Our focus is on His character, His Word, His will. It seems like all the obstacles, we're so focused on God and we see God and we know what God can do. We're so focused on that, we can't see the obstacles. And that is a change of how we view life. So that's one of the things we need to do. Don't be afraid. How many times do we see that in Scripture where the Bible tells us, don't be afraid. You're going to have opposition. That's a fact. You know, Steve read a really good Scripture this morning saying, you know what, anyone who's going to desire to be godly, you will be persecuted. The opposition's never not going to be there. It's just whether or not you choose to be afraid and conquered. But when you open your eyes and you see who God is, the problems in life seem so much smaller. But the second thing that we really need to do is realize that God is present and powerfully at work. You know, one of the things I really appreciate is Mike Forehand, when he taught the book of Acts, and I keep mentioning it, he keeps saying, how is God at work with this? We'd read a chapter and that'd be the first question he asked. How is God at work here? Another way we could interpret that is, how is God present here? How is God's presence realized here? How is God working and present in a guy like him? How is God present like in Mike? How is God present in what Brett is doing? You know, we think about this and we ask, how is God working in all these situations? You know, when I was thinking about God's presence and I was thinking about 
how he works powerfully in us when we recognize his presence. I was thinking of a man who is by the name of Nick Wojtek. This guy is impressive, and some of you may have heard about him. Some of you may have seen him. He's been on TV a lot, but he was born with no arms and no legs. And all he has is a fragment on the end of his body, which he calls his little chicken leg, because that's what it looks like. It looks like a little flipper. And he, every day he would go to school and he would get bullied and bullied and bullied. And even in, throughout his teenage years, every year he said, this is the year I'm going to commit suicide. Why did God make me like this? Why God? And how can people be so cruel? It's bad enough I have no arms and no legs. How is it that they add on to it by making fun of me for it? But what was really inspiring and encouraging was that he opened up the Gospel of John and he read about a man who was blind at birth. And the, and the reason that Jesus gave wasn't because he sinned or because his parents sinned. It was because he was made that way for the glory of God. And that seemed to click with them. And he said, okay, maybe I'm like this for the glory of God. And he said, you know, I hate being bullied in my young years. Maybe I can become a motivational speaker. I have no education in regards to motivational speaking. He had got his degree in accounting. He's like, but maybe I can go and teach kids about bullying. So he picked up the phone and he called 52 different high schools. And they all said, we don't want you. And so he was discouraged, but he said, I'll call one more. And so he picked up the phone, and he called, and on the 53rd one, he, he called, they said, okay, we have a small group of kids, we're going to give you five minutes, we'll pay you 50 bucks. And he said, I'll take it. The thing is, the trip was two and a half hours away, which means five hours worth of round trip time of driving. 50 bucks was just going to pay the gas, because he lived in Australia, where gas is really high. So he gave that money to his brother, to drive him there. And when he showed up there, there were only 10 kids there. And he spoke only for five minutes. And then he got paid and he gave that money to his brother and he drove home. And as he was thinking, he was thinking, well, that was a waste. The funny thing was the next day, he made such an impact on those 10 kids that they talked to everyone about Nick and what he had to say to the point where they were calling, schools were calling him, asking him, to talk about bullying, talk about faith, talk about all these different things. And now today, he wrote books, he's, he gets, and now a guy who couldn't get one speaking engagement, now he gets 35,000 speaking requests a year. And then you ask him, now, are you glad God did not give you arms and legs? And he says, for the glory of God, this is why I was made. So a lot of times we think, you know, we don't have it like that. We have, most of us have arms or legs or whatever it may be. But God was present and working. Are we working that way? No, another thing that we think is God brought success. He so God brought success and brought the enemies in the camp of the king of Israel. And he was there. And, and, and the king of Israel said, should I kill them, my father? Should I kill them? And he said, no, actually feed them. Take care of them and then send them back. You know, we, one of the things that we have to realize is when we do the will of God and we're doing it according to God's word, we're going to be successful. It may not be according to our standards, but it will be to God's standards. And sometimes we won't see the effect of the things that we're going to do. I, I don't know if maybe the king of Israel woke up that morning thinking he was going to have the whole army of Aram in his city, dumbfounded and ready to be killed, but instead sent off. That must have changed even those soldiers who were sent off. But God was successful that day. He opened up the eyes of the servant. Elisha saw God clearly, and he brought success. You know, success is something that we need to redefine because when we redefine everything we do is for God's glory, for Christ to be exemplified, to proclaim that He has been crucified and rose again, and through Him we can experience relationship and grace. So regardless of whether or not I'm rejected, regardless of the response, regardless, God is being glorified, that's success. 
You know, this past week we went to work camp and I thought it was a success. We painted 12 houses. And for my homeowner, it was really important. I talked with the man, I went inside his house. In his house, I could hardly breathe. It just smelled so bad. So, and when I went into his house, I tried to hold my breath as well, best I could, and just tried to talk with him because I couldn't breathe very well. And I was trying to tell my kids, you know, that's the kind of house he lives in. In a situation where he lives in a hard neighborhood, where his mom gave him this house and now he's getting a citation from Columbus saying, you know what, we're going to fine you if you don't clean things up and you might potentially lose your house. And going into his house and seeing, you know, he didn't even have a working toilet in his house. He had to use the restroom when he went to work. And then one day he came in, he was just so thankful for what our kids did. And he bought snacks for our our kids, and they weren't a lot, they weren't fancy snacks, probably cheaper snacks, but he made known, you know what, this was my disposable income for the month. And he gave it to our kids. And I was proud of our kids for serving, and one of the stories I thought about was one, a kid named Blake on my crew. And when I first met Blake that first day, I said, what, what church do you, uh, are you a part of? And he says, I don't really, I, I'm not really part of a church. I, I go to the, the Reynoldsburg congregation because I go to the fun activities. And so I told him straight up, I said, well, hopefully we can change that. <laughs> and so through the week he was serving and he wasn't thinking about himself. And he was telling me, you know, I'm not relig so religious. My dad and mom aren't very religious. My dad works at a casino. But then as the week went on, he said, you know, I'm going to get my license, and when I get my license, I'm going to start coming to worship service every week now. And then he went and he talked with Mike Miller's brother, and he said, is it possible that I can go to church camp? And the, the amazing thing was he invited, he called his dad and asked his dad to come to our work site and help. And his dad came. And the first thing his dad did, and he was shorter than I was, I was like, God bless you. Uh, God can use small people too. VeggieTales taught me that. Anyways, I looked at him and I, he said, what do you want me to do? And I said, get up that ladder. <laughs> and I put that guy up on the ladder and he worked. And then afterwards he came on Friday, a day later. And I had a good conversation when he was on the work site. But it, a, a day later he came to um, the last day of dinner on Friday night. His father came and ate dinner with us. And I got, I had a really good conversation with him. And he was smiling and talking, and he was like, maybe I'll help next year. And I was like, great. <laughs> and then his son was like, Dad, can I go to church camp? Knowing his dad wasn't really religious. And his dad said, yeah, maybe. If we can afford it, I'll Google it, and we'll see if we can make it happen. For me, I thought that was probably one of our biggest successes. Was God present? Yeah. Was God working? And, and that was the amazing thing. That's, and I'm sure if you talk with all of our adults, we have stories that we can share like that about work camp. But one of the things that we, I want us to do is really realize that we can make an impact because if we open our eyes and see who God is and what he can, is doing, we can change things. You know, Walt Disney said, think beyond your lifetime if you want to do something truly great. And that was something that I tried to emphasize to my kids on my crew, was to say, don't think about yourself, think about this man we're helping and the impact that it's making. Think about the impact we're making on our community. And so much so that we had all these kids in our neighborhood passing by us. I got cussed out a few times and got called a white boy. And I was like, I'm Korean. <laughs> but, uh, but they came to our site and one of the boys started helping. Pain, just a neighbor boy. Maybe we made a difference in doing something, being one part in helping love people one step closer to Christ. You know, one of the things that we do, and Mark mentions this verse, I'm so glad he does, because it's one of my favorites, is that Paul tells us, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine according to his power, talking about God, not our own, that is at work within who? Us. 
To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I hope all of us say amen to that. Let's try that again. I wasn't planning this, but if you agree with that statement, say amen. amen. <laughs> All right. Because one of the things that I think about, and as I read this passage, I was thinking, you know what, we often dream as big as we view God. So if you think God is bigger, let's dream bigger. Let's open our eyes to see who God is. And sometimes our eyes are open the widest when they are actually closed. Because when Elisha prayed... The servant's eyes were open, and he saw God present. I ask that this week that you will pray for you and your family and this church to close our eyes and just pray to God to open our eyes and see the presence and the power and the work of God and realize He does work through us. And despite opposition, we can do great things, and we will not be stopped. So let's be that church. Let's open our eyes. And let's realize that God is here working and present. And if we do, we will bring Him the glory that He has deserved. At this time, if you want to give your life to Christ, if you want Him to open your eyes to the joy of His salvation, we offer you the opportunity to come profess your 